Um, right, well, thank you very much um, for having me today. Um, my name's Todd Gray. I'm a historian. I'm not an activist. Um, I'm not a white savior. I have a very straightforward role, and I've had one. I've been doing this for 37 years, and it really feels it today. Um, looking out, seeing how young everybody is. I get up at five in the morning, I work till six at night, and I do this six days a week, and I've been doing this for 30 years. This is why I overproduce. And this is half of my production in the last few years. And what I tend to do is find a research topic which hasn't been explored before. It's a long project, and then I find each thing informs the next work. So fascism in the 1930s has interesting correlations with slavery. Um, what I learn in each time is human nature, and the changes that one finds influences those, those decisions that pe people make in their lives. So the three books which are relevant is this one here, um, which has been reissued because it went out of print. This came out just three weeks ago. What I find in this topic is I am almost always trying to make people interested in it. People who feel it's not their history. So it's interesting to talk to people who are here because they find it interesting already. So I'm not spending half of my time trying to convince people this history is your history. It is extremely challenging. Um, this was my attempt to expand the topic in relation to Exeter on the nature of prejudice, not just race or religion or physical changes or politics, looking at why over 500 years there are the wrong type of people and how that changes with each generation as to who those people are. I cannot tell you how happy some people are with this book because what I have is a constant barrage of comments on the appropriateness of history and how much history is based on inconvenient facts. On this one in particular, um, there's one side that's very hostile and it's ill-informed opinion of the past. And I don't want to offend anybody, and normally I don't get political, but if you are on the right, you're increasingly organized in Devon in the last year to two years. I don't think it's local as much as being driven nationally. The left has been more organized um, and has focused their attention more on how Devon fits into the national picture and in both instances, what I find, the historical evidence gets swept away in opinion with people wanting Devon to fit into a model which is impossible for any county to do. Yorkshire, Buckinghamshire, Devon, no matter where you're from, their county histories are going to be divergent from the national picture because it's the nature of local studies. It's very difficult for people to understand and accept History can disappoint people. The actual evidence is inconvenient. Now, slaving voyages, trade, and slave estate ownership, there are three things I've worked on. Devon was not a leading center of slave voyages. We started off being the, the um, entrepreneurs, and then we fall back on it. Some people see this as denying the past because the evidence isn't there to show how important it was. And you can see the numbers. Trade is more interesting, but we have old-fashioned research on trade. We simply don't know how prominent Devon was in those years. The research that is there indicates from 1670 to about 1740, we were, in Boris Johnson's words, world-beating in our trade. We were exceptionally good at it. And then we got pushed out. But that's old-fashioned research, and I don't trust it. 
is probably true, but what we need is somebody to spend three to four, maybe five years going through all the customs accounts and working out who is making money off of slave-produced goods. And it's probably mostly tobacco and from the Americas rather than from the, from the West Indies. The bottom one is the one I've just worked on. We don't really know 1619 to 1800. We've got patchy evidence, but we can't say Devon is ahead, Devon is representative, Devon is poorer off in slave ownership than any other county. We just don't know. But in 1834, and Matthew is going to be coming up and talking more about this, when emancipation of the enslaved people happens, we've got wonderful documents and 34 Devon people receive compensation as owners. Now there are another 20 odd who had compensation as beneficiaries or they received it as trustees or executives of their estates. That figure is low, but that is not the way to look at it. What is interesting is what happens after 1834. After 1834, former slave owners with money come to Devon and they go to nice places where there are nice things to do with nice people. Torquay, Dawlish, Sidmouth. They're not going to Columpton. If you know Old Campton, they didn't. They go to the seaside resorts, which are fashionable, full of nice buildings, places to go, and they are a new type of Devonian. They're people often with second homes. They come down because this is a nice place to be, and they're peripatetic. They may last here a year or 20 years, but they're equally going to be found in Bournemouth or Cheltenham, particularly in London. They move through society without a loyalty to the place in which they live. They're not like rural Devon, where you can be born and bred in the same place in five miles, and that's it. It's a different type of experience. So what's interesting is that 1834, we can look at the number of slaves that they owned, 5,000 out of 636, not an awful lot, but it expands when you add in the other former slave owners who come down here. Number's nearly 100. So Devon becomes something slightly different. We can look at it as only 34, or we can look at the bigger picture of Devon developing a different way of living, and that's what I think is more important. But incidentally, 10 million quid in today's money is an awful lot of compensation to have for Devonians to lose their enslaved people. Remember, no one in the Caribbean who was a slave got any compensation, it was the owners. So 10 million is an awful lot of money. But this is what I would like to, if I'm probably gonna go on a little bit longer, but I'll be very quick. Try to understand the people involved. So in that book I've just did on Devon's owners of slaves, what I've done is a biography of each one. By looking at the people, we start to try to understand how is it that a man or a woman can live with owning other people and know that their income, their livelihoods, are given by people living in extraordinarily harsh conditions. And this is one of the people that helps us. Dennis Roll, wealthiest man in Devon, he is an idealist. He creates utopia in Florida. He goes out in the 1780s, he gets 80,000 acres of land. He's known for giving working class people who are prostitutes, who are criminals, a second chance. Hundreds of them go out to Florida. It's an extraordinarily successful venture in one way. What American historians fail to talk about is that's paid for by 200 black enslaved people. So he is funding a second life for the white working class with the sweat and the lives of his slaves. Now he dies, his son takes the, gets the um, plantation, which then has to go to the Bahamas because the British lose Spain. So they go to the Bahamas, he gets 5,000 acres, he tries to do the same thing there. There is no way of earning money in the Bahamas. Cotton dies out. So after 10 years, there's no product. What then happens is his son, who inherits 
This man here, Lord Roll, the wealthiest man in Devon, has 200 enslaved people. The way I think of him is he is a Georgian Norman Tebbit. He's got all the charm of Norman Tebbit, if you remember him. If you can't remember him, think Michael Gove. There's a warmth and a cuddliness to him, which <laughs> is extraordinary. He's against everything. Anything in reform, Lord Roll is against. But he does not want slaves. He doesn't want slaves because they lose him money. He has to pay for their food. He has to pay for their clothing. So what he does is tries to free them because he doesn't want to be lost losing 70000 in our money a year on his slave plantations. There's nothing they can do to earn that keep. He tries to make them free. The government says no. If you make your slaves free, they'll all want to be free. Finally, he has to wait 15 to 20 years before he does. He is remembered in various ways in the Bahamas. This is a statue to Pompey, who is the leader of an insurrection, which is partly responsible for them being made free. This is the letter which appears in the local press when he finally makes him free. Now, if you can stick with it, well done. Just read a few sentences and you get a sense of the joy as expressed by the slaves to roll through another channel and ends up in a local paper. It's certainly not their words. But there's a strong but in this. Roll frees his slaves, I would say for economic reasons, but people in the Bahamas, to this day, treat him as this mythological figure, this wonderful man who was kind and gave them their freedom. But he did more than that. He not only gave them his freedom, he gave them the land. He turned over 20,000 acres in the Bahamas to the people who lived there. They then changed their names, surname to Roll, and inherited that land is still in common, held in the Bahamas, and it remains their land 200 years later, nearly. This is, I think, the son of one of those slaves, Mr. Roll. So that helps us understand, I think, slavery. That's out of order, I'm so sorry. I'll come back to that because it's actually great. You may have seen a program with Charlene White a couple weeks ago called Empire's Child. And I did a little piece on that. We were filming at Buckland Abbey, the home of Francis Drake. And the bit which they didn't show was me talking about Drake in a way in which is the interesting part, the part which we have forgotten or overlooked as to what Devon's connection is with slaving. Drake, and you'll know the statue and the fuss about the statue, Drake is criticized because in the 1560s he was a junior officer on the slaving voyages by Hawkins from Africa to the New World. What we don't remember as clearly is his subsequent career as a pirate. And this is brought out with this wonderful image of Errol Flynn and the Seahawk who is playing a Drake figure. What Drake made his career from was not from slaving, but in seizing the goods of Spanish and Portuguese merchants who had taken their slaves to produce those goods, which were taken, of course, originally from the Indi indigenous Americans. So in the Seahawk, there's a line by Errol Flynn, who's criticized by a Spaniard for taking the Spanish goods. And Errol Flynn says, they're not yours anyways. These are things which belong to the indigenous people of America. We could probably call them American Indians. He says, they're not yours. I'm just stealing them from the thief. What they are, of course, are bullion, pearls, trade goods, which should have belonged to the indigenous Americans, worked by 
African slaves seized by the Spanish, they come back to Devon, and that income is what fuels Devon's economy in the 18th century. We are not slavers, we're privateers. Our fortune is not being made by slaving. I don't think it's necessarily slave plantations. What we are doing is taking slave-produced goods out of Spanish and Portuguese ships, coming here. We do not have the stain of slavery on our hands because it's one removed. And that's what we've forgotten. It is still benefiting from slavery, but one away from direct ownership. Now, I don't know why that's been forgotten, but it is not talked about at all. As far as the Devon's connections go, the word Devon itself is a slave name. People will know Devon Malcolm. There are Devon men and women named Devon all across North America and the West Indies. It is a name given to slaves, just as Cities, towns, counties all over Britain, they had their names given to slaves because we do not give them Christian names. We name them Aberdeen. We name them London or Westminster. But Devon is the only one which is continued. And it's got more popular with each generation that goes by. This is one of the hidden legacies of slavery and that the name Devon itself, we forget, is a slave name. And so do they. After 200 years, we forget this history at our peril. Ashish was asking about the landscape and the connections between Devon and the landscape and enslavement. We lose our wool industry, which fuels Devon's economy in the 18th century because of slave-produced cotton. It's much more, it's cheaper, it's much more versatile. That's one of the legacies. Another is salt codfish. Still the national dish of Jamaica, that salt cod was initially made by West Country fishermen who go to Newfoundland and the refuse fish, the ones, the fish they couldn't, the remnants of it, the worst of it, that they couldn't sell in Europe was brought to the slaves in Jamaica and all the other West Indian islands. 200, 300 years later, it's their national dish. There are houses across the Southwest and in Devon, which we can associate with slavery, but not as many as people want to believe because people are overlooking the most important item, empire. It is empire which is building these houses, not enslavement, but empire all across the world, as this house here, Winslade Court, is. But there are loads of examples of that. And then all those people we see as figures in Devon who have a story which we don't know because we don't look for them. The Elphington Ponies, two girls, they're twins, they are fated in Torquay, they are called the Elphington Ponies. They dress alike, they look similar because they're twins, but they walk in unison together and do not talk to anybody in Torquay or Exeter because of it. They are apart. What Torquay didn't realize was the mother was the daughter of a slave. Her grandfather, a slave owner, brought back the girl from the West Indies and they were mixed race. Maybe this is why they kept themselves apart. Two of the most famous women of the 18th, of the, sorry, early 19th century in Torquay. But this is the one I want to talk about. Moses Smith, I think the last slave in Devon. Early 20th century, he dies just before the Great War. He comes from Georgia where he's a slave. He ends up at Biddeford, marries a local girl. He is a fish seller. His wife is a fish wife. He is constantly in trouble for drunken fighting in the streets. And he's called names which I can't repeat now. One of them is a black monkey. Another is a black dog. He finally goes to court. And in court in 1912, he tells the judge, I am sick and tired 
of being called a dog and a monkey. His wife says, I didn't marry a dog, I married a man. He says to the judge, I cannot help the color of my skin. A hundred years ago, I cannot help the color of my skin. He's one of those stories we overlook because we're not that interested in it. But it's also because this topic, and I've been doing this since the early 80s, I got interested because of Maya Angelou, who I met and asked me over a cup of coffee, what is Devin's history of enslavement? I brought out documents, we had a look at them at the record office, we talked again, and it took me 20 odd years to be able to answer the question she asked. Why? Because it takes that long to start up a new topic. Black history in Devon is at its infant stage, and you go wrong because you're breaking ground. You're missing stories, or you're not getting the stories right. But eventually, topics take two or three generations, and then finally, we've got a good sense of the past. This is where we are now, slowly, slowly unraveling the past. But Devon's history is not going to be the same as Cornwall. It's not going to be Yorkshire. It's not going to be Lincoln. What we need to do is accept different stories have different lives. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Um, I've been digging into I've been digging into Todd's most recent book, um, Devon's Last Slave Owners, which you can get copies of outside. Um, Highly recommended. Um, Matt, do you want to uh, come and join us? Matt is the di uh, director of uh, Legacies of Black Slavery at um, UCL. Um, Matt, do you, want to talk, do you want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your work? Sure. Thank you so much, Ashish. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the director of the, Leg the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery at UCL, formerly the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slave Ownership, and I know it's been mentioned before. Um, I'm going to go as swiftly as I can through a presentation because I'm aware we have other presenters in this session. I should start by saying that I have no known personal connections to Devon. I'm from Jamaica. And if there's anybody here from Jamaica knows Kingston, you know that we have a place called Devon in the center of Kingston, which is one of the major attractions to the, set, to the city, um, second only to the Bob Marley Museum, a place called Devon House which was originally named Devon Penn, which I suspect very strongly, of course, was named after uh, Devon. Uh, I want to briefly open with a few words about the work we're doing at our center and then say a little bit more um, with, without going too long, hopefully, I promise, uh, on work that we're going to be doing next. Uh, those of you who are familiar with some of the work that the center has done already, will be aware that much of it has been around questions of uh, the profits made from slavery, the business of slavery, so that's slave trading, but more importantly, ownership of enslaved people in British colonies uh, up to the period of emancipation. And the fundamental data source that we have used has been the uh, compensation that was paid to British slave owners in the 1830s. 20 million pounds, and previously Todd was talking about uh, the figures being fractional of the compensation money that came to slave owners connected to Devon. But if we think about the complete number of compensation, a complete figure of 20 million pounds, that's actually fractional of the total profits earned by slavery, by slave owners, British slave owners, uh, and a lot of that wealth went back into the cultivation of uh, sugarcane and other uh, crops grown by enslaved populations, the slave trade, and of course, in the building of uh, wealth here. Now, for those of you less familiar with our work, this is our website. Our database has now over 60,000 people in it. Uh, it's been the basis of a lot of research that's been done internationally on slave ownership. Um, and it has also fundamentally brought the question of this legacy of slavery back into British history. What I want to do is move from that to think about where we're going next. And I think I'm, I'm framing these, these points in relation to the topic of our symposium, Ecologies of Empire, and thinking about the way in which 
the spaces of colonialism and the spaces of slavery in the Caribbean, uh, in the British Caribbean in particular, are so tied to these bigger questions of the post-colonial Caribbean, as well as questions of empire more generally. Now, I'm starting with an image from uh, Hans Sloane's uh, late 17th century book on his voyage to the West Indies. And you can see the sketch there of the landscape of Jamaica. And what's very readily apparent, hopefully, to everyone is the absence of people. This is a depiction of land, a depiction of space, in which the space becomes prominent and the people who occupy that space don't exist. This is not uncommon for a lot of uh, English sketches and um, portraiture of that century. But what we find is that that approach continues in depictions of the Caribbean. And I'm, I'm glad that, that Paul earlier uh, mentioned Froude and Froude's been um, discussed already. And I think it's important to sort of come back to him because he's such a fundamental figure in the sort of locating of how the Caribbean was seen and written about and received through his work over here uh, in, in Britain. And you see sketches that were included in his book of, um, of the landscape, and similarly, it's devoid of people, and particularly black people who occupied much of that land and who also were the fundamental aspect to this question of the slavery business and Britain's wealth. Uh, two other quick points that I think are useful to mention about Froude, uh, since we are indeed talking about him a bit uh, this afternoon. Number one is that the sort of centerpiece of his argument in that book, The English in the West Indies, as to why Britain can't, should not release the West Indies as part of the empire is Haiti. He visits Haiti before he comes to Jamaica. He, he writes, you know, I mean, Paul used the word uh, stupidly, and, and I, I agree with that. His, his commentary on Haiti about cannibalism and about voodoo and so on is, is something he comes back to all the time when he's talking about the, 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 um, the British islands and saying, this is what they'll end up being if we leave them uh, to their own devices. Uh, and, that's a, that, and, and it's also worth mentioning that his views on Haiti were uh, drawn not only from his very brief visit there, which is documented not just in the book, but his diaries of his travels were later published. And he goes into more descriptions of Haiti in those. Uh, but also his, his sort of cribbing of uh, other British travelers to Haiti in the 19th century, uh, Spencer St. John being a major one, uh, who he, con he repeats a lot of things from, from St. John in it. Second quick thing about Froude is that uh, I'm, I'm glad that the question came up about Froudacity and J.J. Thomas and the uh, other writers who took on Froude in full-length texts, but significantly as well, there were uh, writers and publics in the Caribbean, the British Caribbean at the time, who organized lectures against Froude's book, even if they didn't publish. And so that sh gives you a, 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 vi a wider sense of the kind of uh, upset that he engendered with that work. Moving on, this is, again, just a series of images which I'm just going to slide through rather quickly to show you the, the way in which the landscape, the space of the, um, the colonial Caribbean during the period of slavery was portrayed for slave owners, principally, because these would be sketches that would be commissioned and, and, and taken back to England and hung up in country homes showing what their estates look like. And again, what you see most clearly, uh, two things I think might be apparent, the way in which this mirrors some of the sort of landscape portraiture of the English countryside, and again, that question of the absence of, um, of large numbers of enslaved people who in indeed kept these estates running and kept the wealth of the um, economy going. Now, I'm, I'm going to end on this one um, right now because this is an 1825 sketch of Kingston and Port Royal by James Hakewell. And what's very apparent in this is the way in which the uh, the slave owner and uh, his wife, presumably, is looking out at their property. And as far as you can see from their estate all the way to the coastline, there are no enslaved people. There are no black bodies there. What we are doing in the work that we're moving on to is to try and look beneath that, to try and understand what enslaved lives were like. If we have, which we have done uh, with the work thus far, 
made a very powerful argument about Caribbean slavery and its connection to slave ownership and its connection to British history, we need to now look more closely at that major part of that story of, of British slavery, which is the enslaved lives. And what I've done here is taken one of the uh, Hakewell portraitures of, this is of a plantation in St. Mary, and sort of tried as best as I could to zoom and to magnify those black bodies that in the original are seen in very small dots of the, um, of the portrait, because that's what we need to, to keep uh, focus on. And also, in so doing, this speaks to a point I mentioned earlier, is to also understand how that territory, that landscape, has changed in the post-colonial period. And that post-colonial landscape of what was once uh, entire acres and entire major sections of parishes across the British Caribbean has now, in the, in the independent period, been converted into hotels and into spaces of entertainment. Uh, and this is one such space in Montego Bay, uh, Jamaica. And there are lots of questions around that, that we could expand upon, but I won't hear, but the ecological consequences of that, not just for the coastal regions, but also for the populations displaced, the descendants, if you will, of the enslaved people uh, who once occupied and worked and made uh, the wealth that contributed to the building of the empire in that same space. And to do so, to look at that land and to sort of reinsert that space as a space of Cain, a space of uh, entrapment, if you will, for the captives brought in from Africa to work on those plantations, means really to sort of zoom in as much as we can. Now, one of the things that has vexed historians of Caribbean slavery for a very long time is the absence of uh, consistent data on uh, enslaved lives. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that the data that exists uh, cannot be used systematically. And what we are doing now with the work we're, we're, we're moving on to in this next big phase of our project is to look at, those, uh, at that data, look at those data very, very closely. And one of the key and perhaps the richest source of that data for anywhere in uh, the slaveholding Americas is what was known as uh, the slave registers, filed triennially from 1817 to 1834 as a consequence of petitions uh, here in Britain, over the slow process of abolition after the abolition of the slave trade, there was this insistence that all slave owners had to f regularly file this list of people who were their property. And what we intend to do is to create a database from that, from that uh, source and to use that database that connects to our existing database on, on slave owners and through that, and through that sort of merger, and as well as, as work with um, civil records from the Caribbean, and through that to begin to understand the profiles of these human beings who were part of this enterprise, who in fact made that enterprise. And this, this project we're, we're, we're uh, calling Valuable Lives, Black on Freedom, and the Collapse of Slavery in Jamaica. And we're starting with Jamaica because of its size and its importance in the wealth of the empire uh, during this period. And just some quick examples of the way in which those registers have been used uh, in uh, the Caribbean as markers, as memory uh, of, of people who, who, who lived uh, and worked in these spaces. And this is, these are obelisks at the University of the West Indies campus where the registers, the names on those registers were used, um, have been used as a tribute to the people who lived there. Uh, similarly, artist Laura Facey Cooper, who uh, lives on a former estate in the parish of St. Anne, uh, used the registers for the people who worked on that estate uh, as part of an, art, of an art project that she did, and Carol Crichton has done a similar project uh, using the registers and looking at questions of emancipation uh, in Jamaica with her, her piece. Which this piece is actually part of a series called Materializing Slavery. Uh, we are moving, be, we are moving in a direction where we're looking at the quantitative data and making that uh, through the database and through other information that we can find uh, ways of entering and understanding and, and, and uh, documenting these lives as much as we can. So in other words, the same attention that has been paid to the 60,000 slave owners that exist in our database today we want to do that sort of work for the enslaved people and through that show these sorts of larger connections at the personal 
uh, as well as the imperial. And just very quickly here, uh, I won't stay too long on this. We're, we, we have just completed a pilot project on Port Royal Parish in Jamaica. Um, and we're writing up the findings of that project now. But that project has demonstrated uh, what we're able to do when we harness the technology and the experience we have with creating this database to be able to tell these stories. And here's an example uh, of that. Port Royal today, of course, is generally regarded as a space of piracy, uh, a place of earthquake, a place of all sorts of um, illicit behavior uh, by many of the foreigners who arrived there, but we don't think of Port Royal as also a place of slavery, which indeed it was. Going up until the middle of the 19th century, Port Royal was a parish that incorporated coffee, sugar, uh, as well as coastal uh, mercantile activities. And so we're looking at that sort of interior part of it, taking the registers and uh, creating a database out of it. And I'll end with an example of how we do that. We take, this is a register here of uh, one of the um, estates in Port Royal. From that, we were able to extract the names of uh, some woman, uh, the, Amy, the second name up there, we looked at civil records, looking particularly at parish rec records, which is birth, uh, death, those sorts of things, baptism records, and, be, and we were able to connect that person, Amy, with another reference in, uh, in a newspaper source. And again, doing this digitally allows us to sort of move through it and make these connections. And from that, we're able to, to, to um, build a family tree, a three-generation family tree of an enslaved woman named Amy. And we, our, our hope is to be able to do this database in a way that connects uh, several families, and, but not only show, showing questions of black genealogies, but showing these deeper connections with Britain and also showing activities of resistance, mobility, uh, demographic change, and so forth in these last years of, of British slavery in the Caribbean. I want to end there. Thank you for your attention. Matthew, thank you so much. It's really, really exciting to hear about the direction that you're going to take the centre for the study of the legacies of black slavery. Ron, do you want to um, come up and chat a little bit about, um, about your forthcoming book, Return of a Native? Uh, Vron Ware is a, a, a leading writer on critical uh, whiteness studies and is going to um, tell us a little bit about your book that's forthcoming from Repeater, right? Do you want this mic? Being printed today. Being printed today. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, good thing is it's getting slightly darker, so you can see the slides better. But I know it's been a long afternoon, so it's really great to see you all there. So I, I want to continue with this idea of the importance of speaking from a place, for knowing where we're speaking from, but actually also being able to not be bounded by uh, borders, whether they're parochial, county, national, or whatever, to actually think about where we are in the world. So my book is, is really about um, contesting the idea of the countryside, um, or the idea of rural, particularly rural England, as being outside politics. You know, we hear about the English countryside is, is, is either cons consigned to being a kind of conservative, backward-looking kind of sink that weighs the country down in the past, um, while retaining all its best features that actually aren't really available to most people because they don't feel comfortable in the countryside going to sort of rural areas. They feel there's a hostility, there's a sense of exclusiveness and people feel they don't belong and they shouldn't really be there, let alone being able to walk where they want to walk and so on. So I decided to use my own history of growing up in a relatively rural place in northwest Hampshire to trace the workings of agrarian capitalism, colonialism and the slave trade, industrialization, financialization, militarization, you name it, everything. Trace it from a particular place. So that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, on and off, uh, amidst doing other things. But really looking at how all those fundamental processes that have shaped the world that we live in today, how we think of them actually as not being something we can apply to the rural, but something that started to happen in those places that we think of as rural, 
and the presentations we've heard today, particularly the one about Devon, shows how where we think of a county, if we think of a place we've been outside, and Paul talked about Devon seeming sort of somehow not connected to the history of colonialism or the history of the slave trade, but the more, her, more research you do, the more you find, uh, and as Todd says, the more sort of inconvenient truths you might find and things that are actually stranger than fiction. And believe me, that did happen to me. So I want to use one story as an example, and I had to write it down because there are so many digressions. I could have you here several hours because it's just so fascinating. But uh, it's a story I came to by following a thread that took me through workhouses, rural riots, to the application of science to agriculture, the human diet, the things that connect us all in this room, and the human-centric quest for sustainability, that problematic concept that we all struggle with now. It's a train that leads to the significance of meat eating, and actually I have to say dairy as well, as a major cause of human-induced climate emissions. And as many of you will know, livestock generate about 32% of anthropogenic methane, mainly from the planet's billion plus cattle. Now this is a slightly sensitive topic to raise in Devon and particularly in Dartington where there are many, many beautiful cows. But mainly I'm not talking about uh, cows in fields, although these are becoming a rare thing in this country, believe it or not, but of course the intensively produced um, meat industry. This turns out to be one of the hardest things to change and according to NGOs that work on environmental questions relating to meat production, no country has a real target to reduce its livestock-related emissions or meat consumption. They just don't have a target. It's not something they've really addressed. Actually, the world's culprits are the ones, the, the corporations that dominate the world economy. Um, the three worst performing corporations, according to an article this week relating to COP26 in The Guardian, are two French companies and a Japanese company as well. So it's a truly global issue. It also concerns, once you start looking at it, 200 years of being told that meat is good for you, makes you strong, makes you virile, makes you better than your neighbors. Despite the consequences, uh, the stories about the consequences of too much red meat, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, so I want to start in the present and tell you something about what I found. And I want to start with this little item. This is an OXO cube. I don't know if ever you, I've never, bought one before, but I bought some to show you. So this little thing actually has, uh, it's like a time capsule of the history of capitalism. So it all started really with something called beef tea. Well, it didn't really all start with that. Obviously, people ate meat before, but it starts, this story starts with something called beef tea, which is uh, a beverage, which some of you might have drunk bovril or something similar. Um, Anyway, initially, it was um, a drink that was a remedy for digestive problems or fatigue or other kinds of weakness, you know, when you were convalescing from something. And the basic recipe was to take half a pound of rump steak, salt and a quart of boiling water. You soak the shredded and salted meat, boil for 15 to 20 minutes, leave it to cool, then strain and add water to taste. You basically drink the tea. Uh, the recipe I found didn't say what you did with the meat, but presumably it was a bit sort of soaked and kind of weird. You just drank the water. So I think that was recipe was first read about in Dublin. Um, but in the 1840s, the, the scientist Justus von Liebig, who was based at the University of Gießen, applied himself to the task of making nutritious food that was accessible and available to the growing population. Now Justus von Liebig is an important name because he was a very innovative organic chemist uh, in Germany, who was very innovative in all kinds of ways, his teaching, his practice, his aims. He was an entrepreneur as well. And he was the scientist who most influenced Marx, uh, particularly in his study of and uh, manufacture of artificial fertilizers. And actually, I came to Liebig through studying, the history of, through studying the history of fertilizers, in particular, the use of bone meal as fertilizers, in particular, the use of bones from humans that were gathered from battlefields in Europe for use as fertilizers. So that's part of the story I'm, I'm not going to tell. That has been told very well by other people. So in addition to being a writer and teacher and researcher, um, 
Liebig was very concerned about the human diet. He believed that muscle tissue was an essential component. And he also addressed the fact that people couldn't really make beef tea at home because they didn't have the resources, it was time consuming and required a lot of meat. So in 1847, he produced something he called Liebig's extract of meat. It was a thick, dark brown liquid with a powerful beef aroma that he called Liebig's extract of meat. A teaspoon could be dissolved in boiling water for a health-giving drink. So like Bovril, in other words, which is like a sort of meaty, I think of it like Marmite, but it's not really, it's sort of made of meat. Um, so it took 30 pounds of meat to make one pound of extract. So actually, although this was a sort of uh, you know, ready-made food, it wasn't accessible to most people. And uh, although it was for s the British were particularly interested, although it was made in Germany, um, you could get it in pharmacies in Queen Victoria, and people like that um, believed in it. And in fact, she sent hundreds of jars to Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War uh, to help in the hospital. Florence Nightingale didn't think it helped at all. I think, imagine her opening the basket and sort of saying, oh my God. And actually, she said that when you gave it to healthy people, they actually got sick. But if you gave it to a sick person, it didn't do any harm. But in the second half of the 19th century, um, you know, this interest in diet was really uh, part of the science of uh, organic chemistry and agriculture. Um, nutritional science also developed and actually challenged the evidence that, meat, that this meat extract was beneficial in any way. Studies proved it contained no traces of gelatines, fats or proteins. The Prussian government commissioned trials, but they found it was of no use except for uh, travelers and armies. It's good for armies who might profit from its portability. Um, and then 1868, a German physiologist published the results of his research, which found that if you fed dogs this extract, they just died, basically. So, but in the second half of the, of the 19th century, of course, the European powers were all competing to find new colonial territories to extract uh, goods that they could be made, brought back and made at home. Um, and they needed an inexhaustible supply of meat. And actually, rearing beef is very labor-intensive, cost-intensive. And they were quick to uh, look, they were looking for new territories. And of course, you know, America was opening up as a place where cattle could be grown in large numbers. Here's a Devon link. Uh, in 1624, somebody took three cows on the ship to uh, Massachusetts. And at some point, I think 1627, somebody took a red cow, a Devon red cow, which you also might see as you go around. De red cows are um, one of the breeds that has done well here. Anyway, in 1863, um, after rejecting offers from Mexico, Australia, and North America, where these big sort of areas were being freed up for beef cattle manufacture, not for eating, but for... Um, hooves and bones and leather. Uh, Liebig was approached by a young German businessman who uh, was in charge of building railroads through Brazil. And he suggested they went into business together and uh, purchased 28,000 acres of land at a place called Frey Bentos on the banks of the Uruguay River. 10,000 pieces of machinery were shipped out. The company assembled a largely European immigrant workforce to manufacture the extract using the flesh of cattle that would otherwise have been killed for their hides and hooves. And Liebig was appointed scientific advisor. And he never patent patented his um, inventions because he wanted the world to be able to eat this cheap form of protein. But he died in 1873, so he didn't really see what happened next. So at the same time, canning technology was making it possible to import meat across the Atlantic. Um, and that increased their military clients. 1871, Napoleon III ordered one million cans of beef to feed his troops. He, he commissioned that from a, a Scotsman living in Canada who thought, this is a bit much, and he invented his own kind of extract because there was no patent, as I said. And his extract was first called Johnson's Fluid Beef, which obviously didn't really sell, and then he called it, in 1886, he called it Bovril. See, there's the Bovril thing. The name was Bovinus from Ox in Latin and Vril after an 1870 novel, sort of science fiction novel, about a super race called the Vril Yar, who derived their powers from an electromagnetic source called Vril. So then 
Bovril was a great success, and there was a launch at the 1887 Colonial and Continental Exhibition in London. Now it's owned by Unilever. Um, anyway, in 1873, the year that Liebig died, the company began producing tinned corned beef under the label Frey Bentos. Um, and they also pioneered advertising even after Liebig died. And one of the things they did, because of the lack of patent, they wrote his name, Liebig, on the adverts. And the adverts um, basically looking at the collection of adverts now, you can look at them online, the product was sold all over the world. So you see people in the Klondike drinking extract. You see people in Egyptians building the Suez Canal drinking the extract. You see um, you know, all kinds of people all over the world drinking the extract. You see um, in Italy, the, the adverts were tailored to each national context. So there were images of Dante and, you know, he wasn't drinking the extract, but it was sort of on the side as a sort of national symbol. Anyway, th this story gets more strange. Um, so they also decided, they'd kept this idea, this sort of utopian uh, sense of, uh, of feeding the world. And they wanted a solid version that was portable, particularly for armies. And I suppose, and in um, 1899, the Liebig Company, uh, which had a lot of British investment as well as German, um, launched the trademark OXO and they, they launched a research project to develop a solid version. So that was launched, the solid version, this little thing here was launched in 1910 and um, 100 million, I have to write this down because I've got 100 million of these were provided to the British Armed Forces in World War I. Despite all the research saying it didn't really do very much. In 1920s, the Liebig Company acquired a wharf on the Thames. Those of you who know London might know the Oxo Tower, or they built that. It was a disused power station. In 1924, the Liebig Extract of Meat Company was acquired by another group and called El Anglo. Um, soldiers and civilians were fed Oxo cubes throughout, and tin meat, obviously, throughout World War II. Um, and then eventually, in 1964, they were forced to close the uh, meat packing plant in Uruguay when Frey Bentos was linked to an outbreak of typhoid in Aberdeen. Um, and meanwhile, Britain's plans to enter the common market had affected plans of tr sort of global trade of, of meat products outside Europe, so the sales had dropped. But anyway, in, in 1958, um, post-war Britain tried to struggle to find enough food. Meat pies um, began to be manufactured in England with the familiar Frey Bentos label. In case you've forgotten what they look like or need to be reminded. It's very familiar once you look at it. You sort of will have all seen it before. Um, so today, so in it, the tide sort of turned. Liebig did merge with Brook Bond and then it was actually acquired by Unilever as well. And then in 2008, it was brought by Premier Foods, which is a British-based firm. It also sells Bird's Custard, Ambrosia tinned rice pudding, Mr. Kipling cake, you can see where we're going, Mr. Kipling cakes, and also OXO products. OXO also have a, uh, they're sold under different names in other parts of the world. And the OXO Tower is a high-class restaurant, uh, bar and brasserie, which you might have seen if you've been to the Tate Modern recently, or even the South Bank in London, it's very visible. In Uruguay, the Frey Bentos plant was converted into a museum of the Industrial Revolution in that country. Of course, the business had a massive impact. Imagine shipping over you know, thousands and thousands of pounds worth of machinery and workers um, into a pre-industrial economy. Um, it was one point known as the kitchen of the world, uh, perhaps the first global meat processing plant. And they had electricity three years before the capital, Montevideo. And there's actually housing units for workers built in the neighborhood, and the neighborhood was called Anglo because of the British investment. Just to end, really, um, one reason we got to this was because of the work of the artist Cold War Steve, some of you may know on Twitter, where he um, publishes his work, uh, you know, has done this for, for several years. Um, you might be forgiven for not seeing the Frey Bentos pie, there's three of them, I think, in this particular picture. Um, but this one is perhaps more visible. And in fact, 
Um, there's not really anything you can say, is there? Just like, this is where we're going. And this is um, a lorry full of Fray Bentos pies, driven by the army. Uh, Rhys Mogg, who's not too far from Devon, uh, on the side laughing. And, or not laughing, he's got a flag, actually. Nigel Farage and so on. So that is really, um, yeah, there's not really much else to say, but it's really about, the, the, the serious issue really is, is about an attentiveness to seeing how the processes of, of these, you know, world-changing economic, political, cultural, social forces of, of, of starting with agrarian capitalism change not only places, but also changed human bodies the way in which we think about food and the everyday and how this brings us to the crisis we're in today and perhaps a different way of thinking about questioning what it is, wh why we eat what we eat, what we think is good for us and what we are going to eat in future as well. So if anybody wants this pie, <laughs> I know what I can do with it. Okay, thank you.